Hi folks, Matt McSpirit here, Technical Evangelist at Microsoft, bringing you some incredible news all about PowerShell. And who better to bring us up to speed with some PowerShell news than the man himself, Mr. Jeffrey Snover. Welcome. Howdy, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Good to have you with us. Now, Thanks. bring us up to speed with this news. What okay. do people need to know? Yeah, so today is the most important, most exciting day in PowerShell since we released version one. Seriously. Okay, so here's what we're doing. We are taking PowerShell and we are open sourcing it and making it available on Linux wow. and Mac OS. Awesome stuff. Awesome. So, so give us some more detail. What does that mean for people? Yeah, so basically, so what, what are we doing? We're taking PowerShell, we're making it available on Linux. Uh, initially, that's going to be CentOS, Ubuntu, and Red Hat. Mm -hmm. More will follow. Great. And Mac OS. Nice. So okay. That's the first thing. So that's Next. the first thing. Next, we're taking PowerShell and we're open sourcing it. Okay. Okay. Right. So it'll be available on GitHub and it's being available with an MIT license. Okay, tell us a bit more about that. What does that mean for people? Yeah, so the thing, the great thing about the MIT license it is, it is it a very permissive license. Uh, so it gives people the rights to do lots with PowerShell. Nice. It's one of the best licenses. So, so pe people have been using PowerShell to manage Windows for a while, and now they can use it to manage Linux. So what does that mean? One code base for everything? Yes, exactly. So it's one code base. Uh, so basically we're taking the version of PowerShell, that the production version that we shipped in Nano Server, that was the one that we refactored on .NET Core, and both the Windows PowerShell on the full .NET framework, mm -hmm. as well as PowerShell on the po .NET Core framework, uh, will be open sourced and available to everyone. So awesome. we've got one code base that runs on Windows and on Linux. Incredible. So yeah. centralized management, awesome power for the administrator. Right, and you get all the benefits of open source. You're able to take a look at the source code, so people out there will be able to benefit from looking at production .NET code to see how we solve these things. If there's any question about, hey, how's PowerShell doing something, you can go look at the code, read the documentation if you want, but if that doesn't answer your question, you can go look at the code, and then if you want to, you can change the code nice. and uh, do a, a pull request. And really drive it forward use, with the community. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly correct, because not only are we open sourcing it, but we're, you know, people can take it and do whatever they want to with it. Uh, we are opening it up to community development. So so we will have community uh, co you know, contributors mm -hmm. and committers. So as part of the PowerShell editing services, right now a member of the community is one of the committers for that project. Awesome. Yeah. Great. So I'm guessing it was a pretty big journey to get to this point. So why don't you tell us a bit more about, about how sure. we got here? Okay. So you know, the Mona and Manifesto, I published that document in 2002, sort of laid out the framework. Now, even back then, we start off, the team had deep Unix backgrounds. And basically, what we were doing is we were modeling this uh, on the Unix uh, compositional automation model. Mm -hmm. uh, however, those uh, tools didn't work when we brought them to Windows because of the difference in architectures. If you recall, we talked about this. Windows is an API-oriented architecture, whereas Linux is a document-oriented architecture. So we use the same sort of principles, small tools composed together, interactive shell that then you can script and become more formal, mm -hmm. <coughs> took those same basic concepts and applied it to an API-oriented system. And that's where we got the object pipeline. Nice. Okay. So then uh, from the very beginning, we were very customer community focused, right? Uh, so the initial uh, version, we had over 80 contributors saying, hey, what about this? What about that? Uh, so very heavily uh, community focused. And that's driven us you know, to this day. Now, as earlier we talked about, in a previous session, we talked about this idea of Windows Server eras. Mm. I talked about how we've gone from the era of server to the masses, to the enterprise server, to the data center and the cloud server. Well, in the cloud era, as we go and talk to customers, you know, we really all start with Satya and this enjoinder. Get out of your office, go talk to the customers, mm -hmm. figure out what it takes to make them successful, and then do that. Right? And don't worry about the money. We have smart guys. If you're making our customers successful, we have smart guys that will figure out how to turn that into money. You focus in on what it takes to make our customers successful. So we get out there, we're talking to them, and it becomes very clear. They live in a heterogeneous world. Mm -hmm. They want to use any client they want to use. They want to run their workloads on any servers that they want to use, Windows or Linux, mm -hmm. and they want to run on any cloud. So we're going to help them be successful. Now the challenge is, that's a pretty hard world. 
I mean, that's what they, their requirements are, but that's really hard. So what we're doing with PowerShell on Linux now means is that they are empowered with a single management stack to be able to manage all their workloads, Windows or Linux, on any environment that they want, right? Excellent. Managing it from Mac OS, from Linux, or from Windows. So it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. It's, it's an incredible announcement. And let's just drill into that PowerShell on Linux, some of those benefits in a little bit more depth. Let's uh, help us understand just what some of those are at a high level. Sure. So the key is that you enable heterogeneous management, okay? So you're gonna be able to manage Windows or Linux. Mm -hmm. So it's this single common management stack. So if you're not familiar with PowerShell, it is a distributed, heterogeneous, scalable configuration and automation framework. Okay, so it's a framework. And it has an interactive shell, it has a scripting language, uh, and a set of tooling, integrated scripting environment, et cetera. And upon this, then products are built, right? There's a number of popular products like Chef and Puppet. Mm -hmm. They layer on top of PowerShell to manage things. And of course, we have our own products in this space, System Center and Operations Management Suite. So, you know, Operations Management Suite, the mission of Operations Management Suite is to be able to uh, manage the customer's workloads, whether it's Windows or Linux, anywhere, anywhere. So we run in Azure, but your workloads can run anywhere. Mm -hmm. They can run in Azure, they can run in AWS, they can run in Google Cloud, they can run on-premises using hypervisor or VMware. We're gonna manage anywhere. So that's the mission, and then the question is, well, how do they succeed at that mission? And of course, that's where PowerShell on Linux comes into play. You know, the OMS, builds on top of PowerShell, and so they were doing a great job of that mission as long as the workload was Windows. Mm. Now with this, they'll be able to achieve their mission to be able to manage any customer workload anywhere. So that's the heterogeneous management. Okay. And the key thing is that it interoperates with the tools that you have today. So in Linux context, there's a lot of tools already, right? Well, when PowerShell runs on Linux, we'll be able to run those tools just like any shell. On Linux, there's lots of shells, right? There's Bash, there's C shell, there's K shell, there's T shell, there's Z shell. There's a gazillion shells. So in that context, we're just another shell. And we, just like any of the other shells, we can pipe together the existing commands, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but then there's a scripting element to it, right? So if you run bash, often you then write your scripts in Perl or perhaps Python. Right. And so we're also a great scripting language. So we tie everything together and then add value. And of course, we really add value when you have structured data. And here's the secret. Turns out that a Linux community quietly has been getting more and more structured data. REST APIs surfacing JSON documents. And when those happens, uh, we just shine. You know, we just hit the ball out of the park. So you mentioned community there, actually. It's a good segue into this last point, which yeah. is community is driving innovation. Exactly. So you know, we've always been community oriented, always listen to our communities and prioritize things. But often that would be tell us what your requirements are, and then thanks, you know, uh, uh, in a couple of years I'll give you something. How did I do? And now, as we've been open sourcing components, uh, we're being more community driven, where, you know, the uh, uh, element of communication is the code itself, mm -hmm. uh, and they're helping prioritize sort of the weekly backlogs. So it's a very different world. It's awesome. So help us understand in a little bit more depth some of the key attributes of PowerShell, especially for people who perhaps aren't as familiar with PowerShell, of which there may be a few out there. Yeah, especially you Unix guys. So the key things are we try and create a world of very high level, task-oriented abstractions. So if you look at PowerShell, you'll see it often reads like an English sentence. And guess what? That's exactly what you want when something's gone wrong at 3 o'clock in the morning and you open up a script, right? Have you ever done that? You open up a script and it's Perl at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're like, I'm just doomed. You know, you can open up a PowerShell script and it's going to read like a sentence. You know, get these things, mm -hmm. wear this, do that, et cetera. And it's very easy to flow. Now, if you're a Unix guy, you might look at them and say, oh, I, that's too verbose. Don't worry about that. We have uh, aliases for things. You can be as cryptic and, and shorthand as you want, which is really great for uh, interactive sessions. But for your scripts, it's best to have the more verbose self-documenting mechanisms. Mm. So again, high-level task-oriented abstractions. Again, we're optimized when we get structured data. So what we have is pipelines of objects, and we just hit a home run when you get those. Uh, so structured data, objects, and then converting things that aren't structured data into structured data. So we've got a number of converters from and to. Nice. Um, now, this started, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, right? And management 
uh, the, you know, the world always has been, is, and really always will be a messy world. That's what technology is all about, right? We're constantly innovating, things are constantly changing. And we knew that when we designed PowerShell. So we designed PowerShell as this glue language to be able to stitch together things and solve problems, no matter how we did it. You know, like the business guys have this great phrase, there's no such thing as ugly money. Right? <laughs> so in PowerShell, hey, you know, we have a way, we have a vision of how things should be, but there's no ugly solution. You know, if we have to deal with this technology, we'll deal with that. And so PowerShell is very good at glue. So we deal with XML on Windows, we deal with COM and, and uh, you know, .NET and native APIs. Mm -hmm. So too, in Linux, we'll be able to deal with all the tools and systems that are there. We'll glue them all together. Nice. And then when it comes to the scripting, here's where we really shine. We have an incredibly wide dynamic language. So when I was a Linux guy, I would write these scripts, you know, write a simple bash script. Well, that wasn't good enough. Um, it was, turns out the problem was a little harder, so then you'd start introducing some awk and some sed, and that was a little bit harder, so you'd throw all that away and you bring in Perl, and that would solve the problem except you couldn't read it, or it wasn't fast enough, so you'd throw that away and you'd bring in C or C++. Well, with PowerShell, you have that wide dynamic range, but you don't have to throw your code away with each step. You can start off very simple ad hoc scripts. Then you can add some formalism as you decide, hey, this is something that's going to last. Mm -hmm. You can add more formalism as you're going to share it. And you can even get up to sort of systems level programming techniques with classes and methods and virtualization and class overrides mm -hmm. uh, for more production oriented code. And additionally, it's all uh, metadata programmable, which is to say you can pr write programs which generate programs. So it's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. As the name would suggest, PowerShell. Yes, it is. Excellent. Yeah, there you go. Who'd have thought it? So we've kind of built it up. Yep. PowerShell and Linux announcements, awesome stuff. People are going to want to see it in action. Yeah. So. So we should invite. We should get some people up and, and start to show it. What do you think? Let's let's show them the stuff. Yeah. So first. The up, proof of the pudding is in the eating. Exactly. And what you're going to see now is some incredible demos from a wide variety of special guests we've got. And first up is Krishna, who's going to give us a demo of PowerShell and Linux interacting with Azure. So stay tuned. Great. Hey, welcome, Krishna. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, show us what you got? Thanks, Jeffrey and Matt, for having me here. I'm Krishna. I'm an engineering manager working on the PowerShell team. I'm very fortunate to work on this project. Today, I'm going to demonstrate uh, managing Azure using PowerShell on Linux. As you know, Microsoft's mission is to empower every single person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Well, I'm going to do, show you how you can achieve more managing Azure using PowerShell on Linux. In this environment, I'm using two modules, Azure RM Profile and Azure RM Resources that are part of Azure Resource Manager. These modules were ported to run on Linux. And just to set the context, now you're running an Ubuntu machine uh, using Visual Studio Code. Yeah, I'm using Visual Studio Code. Also, to prepare for this demonstration, I used existing MSDN documentation. Oh, perfect. Okay. So in this environment, I already have a resource, a resource group deployed. Let us try to find out what is there in that resource group. I'm going to use this find Azure RM resource commandlet to find out what is there in my resource group. As you can see, I have a VM named my Ubuntu VM. And I also have a storage space that is supporting this VM. I have public IP addresses, network interfaces, and virtual networks. OK, now let us try to find out what is the status of this VM. I'm running this get Azure RM resource commandlet to find the status of the VM. As you can see, the VM is in running state. Perfect. Okay. Now I'm trying to stop the power of the VM. Okay, by using invoke Azure RM resource action. As you can see, this single command line, if it is there in a script, the script can work anywhere without change with PowerShell. And so you got these command lines from the documentation. So you just cut and paste the Windows documentation. Exactly. Right here. Exactly. The same command line works as is on Windows, on Linux, and Mac, and possibly wherever PowerShell is. 
Excellent. Nice work. Awesome job, Krishna. Great demo of Azure, PowerShell, and Linux. What did you think? Yeah, so you know, one of the great powers of PowerShell is giving a tool, a framework for developers where they write just a little bit of work, these commandlets, just a little bit of code, and then we provide an incredibly rich environment. That's why so many people, so many application developers uh, love PowerShell. And that's been great, but it's only be uh, available on Windows. Mm -hmm. And now those people, they need to be able to provide that experience to the entire total addressable market. It needs to be Windows and Linux, so. Cool. across across the cloud as well. Yeah, exactly. So that was just a fantastic demo. Awesome. Great. So next up, we've got another cool demo, this time focusing on Python and REST and JSON with Jason. Take it away. So Jason, welcome. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself and show us what you're, you got. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jason Shirk, and I'm a developer on the PowerShell team. I've got a couple demos for you today. I'm going to be showing PowerShell running on Linux and interacting with Python. And then I'm going to show another demo using PowerShell to work with the GitHub APIs. And I'm going to be showing that in Visual Studio Code and some of the things you can do with Visual Studio Code. So let's start off with the Python demo. The, uh, I'm going to, Python is just uh, another shell and a scripting language that you can use from PowerShell, just like you might use Perl or whatever. And I'm in, the, I'm in Linux here right now. And I have a PowerShell window up and running. And we're just going to start running some some commands. So we're going to start off, we're just going to run you know, an ordinary command like you'd expect in a shell, Python, and Prince hi. So let's just make sure I get this. So this is, you're just launching any executable, and that executable happens to be or the binary, and that yep. binary happens to be Python. It happens to be Python. Perfect. Yep. Really simple. Uh, but often you want to capture the output of uh, some other program in, uh, in a variable. You may want to do something with it later. So let's go ahead and do that. And so it's the exact same command. We just uh, assign it to a variable. We run that, there was no output, but now we have it in a variable, so let's go ahead and print that out, and there's our output. We can go ahead and mix it up a little bit. So this expression here, we have some PowerShell, the five plus at the beginning, and the plus seven at the end is PowerShell, and then we are capturing the output of the Python command in the middle. So Python's gonna run this little script, two plus three, it's gonna print five, and then PowerShell's gonna take that string and convert it to an integer, uh, because PowerShell is smart like that. It knows that you're adding some, some numbers. And then uh, hopefully we should get 17 if it's uh, working correctly. And that yeah. was using command substitution. Again, a concept that we picked up from the Unix shells. Exactly, command substitution. Powerful stuff. Very useful, very, very useful. So uh, our next example here is using a here document, or here string. We call it a here string in, in PowerShell. Uh, but it, you know the, the syntax comes from uh, or very, it's very similar to what you might think of as a here document in, in uh, Bash or in, in Perl. So it's very familiar. So here we're going to create a file, and we are going to write that file. Or so the, the contents of the file is being uh, sent through this pipe to out file. We could have used the file redirection operator that you're familiar with, but we're using this just to show a PowerShell way to do it. We're going to create this file called hi. Right, and that you can uh, define the encoding. Exactly. That you want. So we may want different encodings, binary or, or ASCII, UTF-8, whatever. And so because it's a shebang, you have to go to change mod, and make it executable, and then we can run it, and it worked. So let's take a little more complicated example. This is another Python script that uh, has a class, and you know, some work with some data. Uh, it's going to convert that data to JSON and then uh, print out the JSON. Right, so let me make sure I get this right. So you got Python, mm -hmm. and you have a native Python class, yep. and then this script then takes that Python class and converts it to a JSON string. Yes, exactly, converting it to a string. Because you know, scripts, Python, or, you know, scripts on Unix, they work in strings. So let's go ahead and run that, and it outputs that string. And it's well-formatted JSON, but it is still a string. So now we can go rerun that same script, and we're going to convert that string into a JSON object in PowerShell. So, so we're going to be able to work with that data uh, as a rich object instead of working with strings. So now we've run that. And so it output an array. So let's go look at the first element. First element's foo. Look at the second element. And second element is some more structured data. Uh, so we can go dive down a little bit deeper into that structured data and see what we've got there. And uh, with yeah. a pretty nice, simple 
clear syntax. Exactly, exactly. So then we could take what we just did there and we can drop it into a PowerShell script and run it. And now we can hear we're capturing the output in the parentheses of running that PowerShell script and also getting the data out of there. Right, so this is an example where wrapping existing uh, Linux executables and ways of doing things in PowerShell transforms it into an object world and you get a nice object experience. Exactly. And so for one last example, we're going to, we've got a PowerShell script and we're just going to run some Python from inside the PowerShell script. So we're going to start off printing a string, hello from PowerShell, run a Python script, and then do some more stuff from PowerShell. Let's go ahead and run that, and it worked. We got the output we expected. So, so we demonstrated this with Python. It could have been Ruby, it could have been Perl. It's just another scripting language uh, that we're interacting with. It, just any tool that you're familiar with, Python, whatever, it doesn't matter, we work with it. So we'll move on to another example with uh, REST. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio Code. And so I'm still here on, on Linux. And we are... Now it's worth pointing out, Visual Studio Code uses the PowerShell editor services, which basically means that it gives the customer their choice of editors and they'll get rich language support, right? So we support which to start off with? Visual Studio Code and Sublime? Yes, yes. So. So I'm going to be demonstrating uh, Visual Studio Code, um, but yeah, we have we have some support for Sublime as well, and then eventually, you know, we hopefully we'll see support for uh, you know my favorite editor, VI or Vim, and uh, maybe Emacs too. You know, we'll yeah. see. Uh, so, but yeah, so the editor support is giving us great things like um, com completion. So I'm as I'm typing, you know, it's f filtering out my uh, and it's giving me help on the on the parameters. Uh, you know, it's giving me whatever kind of completion I might need to help me uh, edit my script. And that is really fast. Yes, very fast. Um, but the, another, more, more than we expect be, to be able to debug our script. So, so this particular script that I've got here is going to go off and fetch some issues from GitHub. And we're going to do a little bit of processing on the issues. We want to know, uh, maybe, maybe we want to know like what is the, the top 15 issues that have been commented on. Like how many, maybe the most discussion to see what's, what's being actively discussed. So we're going to start off with this invoke web request commandlet. And we're going to, we're going to go call this uh, GitHub API using this URI. So that's a REST API? The REST API. Yep. And return in what, a JSON document? Yeah, so it's going to return a JSON document. And it's going to, it's going to have a header. And so we're going to take the content and we're going to process that. And we'll get rich objects out of that using the convert from JSON that, that I showed before. And then, because uh, the way GitHub API works, you know, you're going to have a next link that you're going to have to go follow to get all of the issues. So we're going to just loop through and, and keep processing uh, all the URIs to get all of the issues. And then, so so we're going to just start off get some some issues from PS Readline. Some of you might be familiar with, and if you're not familiar with it, it's just going to give you the the command line experience you're used to with Bash. The same, basically, the same command line editing. By the so way, I like that. This is a great example of where uh, we take the underlying mechanisms and then are able to surf it as this nice high-level task-oriented abstractions. All that REST, GORP stuff. Then the user gets to consume that as get issues, the username, and a, a repo. Exactly. So, so I just hit F5 to run this script, and I had set a breakpoint on line 33, and so my script just ran, and it stopped here. So now I can you know, do typical debugging sorts of things. So I like, I'm hovering over issues, and, <clears throat> and I can see, I can, you know, I'm, in, I'm basically debugging here now. I can, I can go dive down into the issues and see you know, what's in here, and we see rich object here. We can see all the different properties and we can see the values. Uh, and now I can start stepping through my script. So, so as I described before, I wanted to get the top 15 co most commented issues. So, so this pipeline reads pretty much, you know, it's like English. Uh, I take the issues, I want to sort descending on the number of comments, and pick the first 15 of them, and then I want to get a nice table output showing me I want, I want the, you know, the ID on the, the issue, and I want the number of comments, and then the title. So I can go back and take a look at that. So let's just run that. And let's uh, show the output there. 
So, so here we have uh, that output. So PowerShell did the formatting for me. I didn't have to like really think, oh, how, how wide do I want this column and whatnot. Uh, it just took care of all that for me. I didn't have to worry about it. And so now I'm, maybe I want to do a little more processing on, uh, on these issues. So maybe I want to look for uh, specific issues that, you know, in this case, the example I have, I want to find uh, issues that have two labels. One of the labels will be bug and the other label will be VI mode. And let's see if we have any of those. And I'm not going to step through every single issue because there are uh, plenty of issues. Uh, but I just hit F5 again and had a breakpoint. And now we're on the issue that uh, happens to be a VI mode bug. And I can hover over issue and now we can see some specifics on this. Here's the title, and I can go down in here and see the labels and dig a little bit more. There's bug and there's VI mode, so oh, sure enough. Sweet. So that all worked as we wanted it to. And there we go. And it should have printed out at the end there. And now I have the, uh, the URL for that particular bug. I can go investigate some more. So that is uh, PowerShell running in Visual Studio Code and using REST APIs. And, and like we said, you can, you can use uh, Sublime um, and in future other editors as well. Yeah, you know, on Unix, uh, you, you know, shells are just sort of a lifestyle choice. You pick your favorite shell, I pick my shell. There are lots of shells. Uh, but clearly one of the advantages of PowerShell as an interactive shell is the rich tooling that you can get and support for authoring. So Yes, it's great. Love it. Thanks. Great, nice job, Jason. Again, great demo. What did you think of that one? Yeah, so I thought that was a great illustration of the point I made earlier about it's a messy world, mm -hmm. and PowerShell is designed to deal with that messy world by being able to interact with other systems, being able to call it Python. Did you see how easily that flowed from one language to the other? You made it look easy. It did. <laughs> and then, uh, again, how when when things are surfaced through REST APIs and JSON documents, uh, PowerShell is able to just bring an incredible amount of value to, uh, to that scenario and more and more of the world. Uh, services, uh, cloud services, and, and just Linux itself is being exposed as either REST APIs or commands, binaries, that generate JSON. So. Nice. It's a beautiful world. It is, and, and sticking with the theme of management and managing these heterogeneous environments, next up we've got Patrick who's going to showcase management of containers, an yeah. incredibly hot topic. This is in, crazy cool. In the Windows and the Linux world. So he's going to showcase some cool container management with Docker. So take it away, Patrick. Hey, Patrick, welcome. Uh, why don't you yeah, introduce you. yourself and show them what you got? Sure. Hi, I'm Patrick Lang. I'm a program manager working on Windows containers and Hyper-V. And so the demo I'm going to show you today is actually using PowerShell to manage um, some Docker containers running both on Linux and Windows. So when we first started developing containers on Windows, you know, of course, we used the open source Docker API. Mm -hmm. But of course, we also had some uh, familiar Windows admins that said, hey, I like PowerShell. Can I use it with Docker? And we said, sure, let's do it. So what I have here is I've got a machine that's running Windows Server 2015 uh, Tech Preview. And in this window on the right here, I have a, a PowerShell window you know, running locally on the Windows machine. But then on the left, I have an SSH session that's connected to um, an Ubuntu 16.04 server. And on both of these, I have PowerShell installed using this, the same uh, uh, Docker PowerShell module on each one. Great. So let me go ahead and start the demo here. So the first thing I'm going to do on each machine is go ahead and import the Docker module. And then I will go ahead and pull down a container image. So this is going out to Docker Hub, doing effectively the same thing as a Docker pull would do, and retrieving an image from the public repository onto my local machine so I can go ahead and run it. And so I use this same command in each place. However, because it's two different OSs, I actually pulled a different version, different image on Windows than I did on Linux. Oh. But same command, I'm just running slightly different code inside of them that's tailored to the OS I'm running. Perfect. So now that I've pulled the image, I'm going to go ahead and run it on each one. Okay, so on the left, we see the Hello World output. This is the same thing that um, you would have used probably the first time you ran a containers mm -hmm. um, using Docker. 
And then over on the right, we've got the quick image that I put together um, that ran as well. So now I'm going to make a little more room to talk about the next command and just clear each of these. Okay, so now let's get into something interesting. So this next command I'm going to run, get container, is of course going to get all the containers on the system, but using the magic of PowerShell, I'm going to go ahead and use the built-in where command that, so I can filter that output as it comes back from the get container commandlet. So when I do get container and where, I can say, okay, this is selecting what I actually want to remove. So now the next thing to do is, now that I've located the data I want, I want to... And this is the benefit of the, the calling a REST API that returns a JSON document, right? Mm -hmm. So you converted that to yep. objects, and yep. you don't have any of that text parsing. Yep, exa thing. exactly. These, this, is, this is all objects. I don't need to invoke said. I don't need to pull out my regex cheat sheet. I can just do it right here natively in PowerShell using something that's a plain English language. Awesome. And so next thing I want to do is, well, I mean, PowerShell has a pipe. Let's go ahead and pipe it to remove container. So I'll run that on each side. And what this did was it took my exited container that was left on disk and just simply removed it from the system. Mm -hmm. So now I've cleaned up after running that, that image. And now the last thing I'm going to do is, you know, Hello World isn't something I necessarily want to roll to production, so I'm going to free up some space and just remove that container image. So if I do remove container image on each machine, that'll go ahead and delete that. And then, of course, if I go and do get container image on each one, we see that the Hello World images have been deleted. So I can manage um, both pull, pulling container images down from Docker Hub, removing them when I'm not needed, but I can also launch, start, and manage containers um, as needed using native PowerShell uh, commandlets that we've written in our module. Well, that's just a great demo. Now, as I understand it, these commandlets are talking to the REST API. So presumably, they're mm -hmm. talking to the local REST API. Yeah. What if I wanted to do it to a remote machine, like say manage beyond Windows, sorry, mm -hmm. beyond Linux, and manage a remote Windows container? Yeah, absolutely. So if I look Did at you do that, yeah. So if I could do get container image, yeah. let me just pull up the um, command completion here, and we actually have. Um, a command parameter host address. Uh -huh. So if I wanted to manage a remote host, I can manage any host that is that is using the Docker REST API. Windows or Linux. Yeah, Windows or Linux, it would work the same either way. Awesome. And in addition to that, you know, if I wanted to do a lot of actions on the same machine, I can also use the, the familiar um, Docker host environment variable, set that to a remote machine instead, and then go ahead and manage that machine. So, so does that mean I can go? To, I could have set that variable mm -hmm. on Linux to point to a Windows box, yep, and then run exactly the same uh, 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 script, the demo, and it would have yep. gotten the, the output of uh, yep. Windows. Yep, the same, same PowerShell commands. Um, you can manage you know, the, the Docker host whether it's running Windows or Linux. That is just fantastic. So, Thanks yep. so much, Patrick. All right, thank you. Awesome job, Patrick. Container technology, phenomenal. Isn't Everybody's it? talking about it. And Docker, again, a great technology and great demonstration. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, that team made a fantastic decision to forego a proprietary management stack and adopt Docker. And that was the decision that allowed that demo to happen. Mm -hmm. And I love that demo because it really highlights this idea of being able to manage anything from anywhere. Exactly the same script running on Linux, as running on Windows. And you see that? You just change the environmental variable, yep. and then you could run exactly the same script, but now targeting a remote system, whether it's Windows or Linux. And so it's, it's just, a reuse of skills as well. If people have already invested time in Docker, they could, they've now got a whole No, exactly right. Area. That's one of my favorite things. The PowerShell available on Linux means if you're a PowerShell guy, all of a sudden, you can now manage a whole lot more things. Uh, your skill set is applicable to a wider range of things. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That means you've become more marketable and more valuable. And I love it when my customers become more valuable. Exactly, so. yeah, it's all cool stuff. So the next demo we've got is Joey, who's going to show us how PowerShell adds value to native Linux management. So take it away. Welcome, Joey. Why don't you introduce yourself, and uh, what are you showing us? Thanks for having me, Jeffrey. Uh, I'm Joey Aiello. I'm a PM on the PowerShell team. And I'm really excited today to be showing an example of a native Linux commandlet, uh, or excuse me, native Linux binary uh, wrapped with a PowerShell commandlet. Cool. 
So, uh, so today we're going to be showing uh, CronTab, uh, which is a tool managed uh, used for managing uh, cron jobs on Linux. Mm -hmm. Cron jobs are essentially like uh, scheduled, scheduled tasks, tasks on, on Linux. Um, and CronTab is very popular uh, binary for, for managing these things. So we've created an example uh, which essentially wraps this up uh, with all the, the goodness of PowerShell and IntelliSense and tab completion and uh, parameter completion and, and all that good, ver you know, more verbose sort of human readable, uh, you know, command syntax uh, that, that, that PowerShell users know and love. Great. So, uh, so we're going to start off here. I'm just going to show, uh, you know, us getting the existing cron jobs on the machine, um, which if everything goes well, are, are is nothing, right? So we don't have any cron jobs yet. Oh, okay. Um, but if we were to want to uh, to make a cron job here, so you know we've got this awesome new cron job commandlet, and like I said, um, you know we've we've got all this this uh, parameter completion. So when I hit tab here, you know you see you've got username, minute, hour, day of month, month, day of week, etc. Um, these are not those sort of arcane you know Linux parameters that uh, cron tab users would be used to, but uh, but ones that are, are very you know descriptive and and uh, verbose here. Right. So, I always like to joke, you know, what does dash L mean as a parameter switch in Unix? And the answer right. is, I don't know. Anything, right? <laughs> exactly. yeah, it depends, depends on the, on the tool. Yeah. Right. But here when you say dash day of week, you know, what does the dash day of week parameter mean? You pretty much know what you're, it means. You're pretty sure, yeah. yeah. And what's awesome is, you know, for, for, uh, for parameters where I, I want to get some more information about the types of values that I can put into yeah. this thing, for instance, username, um, I'm also able to tab complete here on the available usernames. So I just oh. hit tab here <laughs> and you awesome. actually get all of the usernames that are available on the system. Um, so this is just kind of the, the sort of thing that uh, you know people who, who use PowerShell on Linux will, will get to experience uh, for the first time here. That's fantastic. So very exciting stuff. Um, but I'm going to show here, so, so we want to make a, a, a new cron job here. This one's going to, uh, it's going to delete our, our temp folder every, every, uh, every single day at 1 a.m. Um, and you'll see here, uh, the command that we're going to run is, is rmrf uh, temp star, um, and we're going to run it at 1 a.m. dash hour. Uh, so run this guy, and you'll see right here in the, in the terminal output we've got uh, nice tabular uh, you know headers, minute, hour, day of month. You know we see hour one. We're running this command. It's it's very clear what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I don't have to dive into any man pages. I, I know what's happening. Um, so similarly, we can add some more jobs. Uh, those jobs could, for instance, run a Python script that's backing up all of my users. Um, that's going to happen you know every weekday. Or I could have a script that's running uh, the PowerShell build. Um, so go ahead and sounds great to me. Do these ones, yep. And you'll see we we've now got these these new cron jobs, uh, and and of course we want to see that these cron jobs exist. Just so you know, we're not doing anything crazy in PowerShell land here. We're going to run the native binary cron tab, and you'll see that we actually get uh, all of the cron jobs that we just created with new mm -hmm. cron job. Um, of course, you know this this output is a, is a little less. Uh, self-evident what's going on here. You know, you've got to know that this syntax uh, here, what, what each asterisk means and, and so on and so forth. At some point I knew what each one of the columns was. That was a long time ago. It was, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just that sort of uh, muscle memory, right? But, uh, but with, with PowerShell, we, we don't have to rely on that muscle memory. Um, and similarly, you know, we, we can filter for these things, right? We want to get cron jobs that we know run every day. Um, and, and you know we, we know okay this this uh, this temp clearing one and this PowerShell build those are the ones that run every day because they've got day of week uh, you know star um, similarly we we can use this filtration to actually uh, remove some cron jobs that fit uh, certain criteria so um, you know we want to actually pipe you'll see we're we're piping get cron job through where object to find the the PowerShell based tasks and then we're going to pipe that to remove to, gotcha. to delete the thing. So when you do get cron job, we're transforming that into a set of objects, and then the, you get it, have the rich object-based filtering and formatting. And yeah, totally. So under the hood, we're just doing uh, some basic regex, but the, the brilliance here is that we we only have to do that regex one time. Yeah, right. I don't exactly. have to memorize that regex forever. Yep. Um, but uh, but yeah, you'll see here, and and what's what's cool as well, you know, we uh, we we set an attribute here that makes sure that. We're actually uh, confirming with the user that we want to remove that cron job uh, in advance. So, uh -huh. so I'm getting this nice confirmation prompt from PowerShell before I remove the thing, and I can say yes. In fact, I'm okay with removing that. And now you'll see, uh, you know, with get cron job, we uh, we now only have these these two jobs. And uh, you know, similarly, anything that's got these this this demo comment in here, right? I can go ahead and clean those up as well using the. Uh, you'll see the dash force parameter right here. This guy's actually going to say. 
hey, I don't care about the confirmation prompt, just go ahead and do it. This is great for non-interactive scenarios. I know you what know. I'm doing, I'm an expert. Exactly, I'm an admin, you know, don't, 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 uh, don't tell me what to do here. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's gonna clean up the rest of those, and, and now again, we can show uh, right here with, uh, with the native binary that in fact, we've, we've got no cron job, so we're all done. Fantastic stuff. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, nice job, Joey. Excellent stuff for managing native Linux with PowerShell and something we've been leading up to, I guess, at this point throughout the presentation, that native management. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so you know, I once had a conversation with the CTO of Chef, uh, Adam Jacobs, and he talked to me about a customer who was going on about how they loved Linux. However, they said the only problem is these configuration files. Like sometimes I edit the configuration files and I enter the wrong value or the wrong syntax, and then I get these bizarre error messages. He says, wouldn't it be great if we had, uh, you know, APIs to manage these configuration files that then did error checking and schema validation. Mm -hmm. And Adam turned to the guy and said, well, you want Windows, because that's exactly what Windows does. And my joke was that was the guy's crying game moment, <laughs> okay? So the point is that the, the guy had it exactly right. When you're, you know, in this world where you're running production things and you're going fast and, and mistakes are really uh, uh, costly, mm -hmm. you want an environment where you can make changes and know that those changes are correct, uh, be able to hand t t off to someone who is perhaps less skilled than you and have the confidence that they're gonna make changes that are successful. And so that's what PowerShell does by being able to wrap the existing Linux management stuff in these high-level task-oriented abstractions using uh, good schema definitions. Mm -hmm. So we orderly manage, orderly change the underlying system. And then when we get it, we get objects back, structured data. And you just saw from the demo how when you get structured data, the wonderful stuff you can do. Back to that world. We always try to create this world where you think about what you want, you type it, and you get it. And you're not spending all your time thinking, well, how do I do this? How do I cut off three lines? How do I go over 27 columns? You just say, hey, give me these where the day of the week equals Friday, and you get it. And it's done. Yeah. Make it so. Yeah, make it so, there exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. easy stuff. So we've talked about containers. We've talked about native management of Linux. We've talked about Python, REST, JSON, Azure as the, as the cloud platform. What about other clouds? What about other platforms? So in the next demo, we're going to hear from Steve Roberts from AWS. He's going to show us PowerShell and Linux and AWS. Take it away. PowerShell on Linux, pretty exciting stuff. So I'm super thrilled to have our great launch partner, AWS. That's right, Amazon Web Services, here to show you PowerShell, their AWS commandlets, um, PowerShell commandlets running on Linux. Mm -hmm. And with me, I've got uh, Steve Roberts. Hello. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So what are we going to show them? So we're going to show a very short demo of how to um, upload a blog. I want to write a blog about our new power, just power, AWS PowerShell .NET Core module um, to an Amazon S3 bucket. Fantastic. Let's show them. Four simple commands. So the first thing I'm going to do, I've already set up credentials and we're going to put it into US East 1. So the first thing I'm going to do is create myself a bucket to hold the static content. Then I'm going to configure it as a website with a single command. Just like I would set a default document for, say, iOS, mm -hmm. I can do the same thing with an S3 bucket. Then I'm going to configure a policy on that bucket. Right now, that bucket is private. So no matter what content I put in there, no one else can see it but me. It's not very helpful for a blog site, right? Right. So <laughs> I'm going to att attach a policy to the bucket. Uh, here's the policy here that's going to allow public read to yeah. everybody. Looks like JSON. Looks like JSON. OK. So we'll do that. That's it. I now have a static website in an Amazon S3 bucket ready to take content. So I've already pre-created uh, a blog site using Jekyll, so I'm just going to jump in here. And then I'm going to use a single command to do the upload, write S3 object. And this can do individual files, folder hierarchies, inline content, etc. It's now sending the content to S3. We're done. Should we have a, a website? We have a website. Seriously. Wow. Website. Yeah, no wonder people like these commandlets. This is pretty exciting. So uh, tell me a little bit about why uh, it was exciting for AWS to take your Windows commandlets and make mm -hmm. them available on Linux. Well, for me personally, it was because you know, I'm a PowerShell user, right? And I spend my days working across Linux machines, Windows machines, Macs, and I love PowerShell. And I could only use it on Windows. Right. right? Now I can use it on all of those machines. It's just awesome. Um, yeah, it's great fun. Yeah, that's that manage anything from anywhere yeah, yeah. to really empower our customers and let them pick what they want yeah. to do. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for working with us. Thanks for joining. Yeah. 
Awesome, nice job from Steve, demoing yes. PowerShell Linux and AWS. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so you know, uh, when Satya told us, get out of your offices, go talk to customers, figure out what it takes to make them successful. When you focus in on what it takes to be, uh, make a customer successful, sometimes that makes strange bedfellows. So indeed, when we went and talked to customers, they want to be able to run any client to manage their workload on any server, mm -hmm. on any cloud. So guess what? That means we're going to go work with people who are not Microsoft's traditional yeah. partners. We shouldn't penalize people for decisions they've made in the past. We're going to help them be successful. As yeah. you say, help them be successful, we'll figure out how to uh, monetize that at some point. Yeah. So the AWS guys had done a fantastic job with their commandlets, but again, all this great stuff only available to the Windows team. And now that great automation will be available to all of their customers. So again, uh, just a fantastic example. Awesome stuff. So that was AWS. US, but next up, we're going to take a look at some VMware integration with PowerShell. Yeah, who would have ever guessed, right? From, yeah, Launching exactly. with AWS and VMware. Well, they just got a great demo. Come there on you in. Go. Cool. Yeah, we'll hear from Alan. Take it away. Howdy, I'm Jeffrey Snover, Technical Fellow, and joining me is Alan Renouf. Alan is with VMware. Now, if you're not aware of this, VMware is one of our largest and most active PowerShell communities. In fact, they were one of the very earliest adopters of PowerShell. So, Alan, tell me, uh, what, what are you going to show here today, or how are you thinking about PowerShell on Linux? Oh, Jeffrey, you know what? We love this. I mean, for a long time now, our customers have had this love-hate relationship with PowerShell and PowerCLI and the work that we're doing there. They've seen what we're doing, and they love the fact that we have all these commandlets that work against their environment and automate their infrastructure from end to end. But unfortunately, the Linux and Mac guys are not feeling the love. They, they don't, they're not able to use this because clearly it's been a Windows technology until now. So the fact that we can take this and we can give it to them is just absolutely awesome. They will start feeling the love again and they will love us. So what you can see in front of you is that I have a script that I wrote a while back that was actually written in ISC on Windows, but I have um, open in Visual Studio Code at the moment on my Mac. Um, and it's a very simple script, you know, it's 20 lines of code, but what it actually does is a lot. It will go through and it will deploy a bunch of virtual machines into my environment, into my vSphere environment, and it will customize them, it will tag them, and it will power them on. So this short amount of code will do an extremely large amount of things. So let's see this working and the way that we're going to see this working is actually through a docker image believe it or not we've built a, a simple docker uh, file that will launch power cli in a docker image and in this case it's going to use ubuntu and we're going to run the docker image it's going to boot that docker image it's already installed powershell and power cli within a couple of seconds you can see i've, I've automatically opened my power cli shell and the cool thing about this is if you take a look at the amount of commands that we've actually ported across already, I'll do more because you won't believe the amount that we've ported across. We've actually got a bunch of commands that we can step through here page by page, and you can see that we've got commands that all manage every aspect of the vCenter infrastructure already. Good heavens. That's enormous. great thing about this, as I said, is right, it doesn't matter where you write this script. We can run it anywhere now. I could run it on my Mac. In this case, we'll go and we'll, we'll exit out of the more, and we will run it in the Linux Docker here and go and deploy all those virtual machines. Wow. So now this oh, yeah. is taking the script you originally wrote on Windows. You showed it to us running Visual Studio Code on a Macintosh, and now you're running it in a Linux Ubuntu uh, Docker container? That's right. You stayed with me the whole way. That's fantastic. <laughs> Awesome job from Alan there from VMware. So what are your thoughts on that final demo? Yeah, again, a great example of us. You know, this is not your dad's Microsoft, right? Under Satya's leadership, it really is a new Microsoft that is absolutely customer obsessed. Mm -hmm. And we're working with our non-traditional partners. I think they are benefiting from it. We are certainly benefiting from it. The thing I'm absolutely certain is our customers are going to benefit from this. So, And that's the main thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So bring people up to speed. What, what do people need to do next? Great. 
Yeah, so basically a call to action is uh, all the source code and the releases. The alpha release, be clear about that, it's an alpha release. Uh, that's available on the GitHub today. Uh, so you can go to that link and we'll have it in the show notes. Uh, go to there, grab it today, kick the tires. Tell us what you, what's working for you, what's not working for you. Help us prioritize our backlog. Mm. Uh, we really want you to get involved. Uh, submit any problems you have. Help us get it right. Let's be clear. We are in learning mode, right? So we're not taking anything for granted. We approach this with humbleness and sort of a challenger mindset. We want to get this right. And we're listening for what are the things uh, open to hearing where we're not getting it right, et cetera. Uh, so we want to hear from you to find that. And also, if you want, if you're a developer, you want to contribute code, please contribute some code. Join the community. Fork the stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you go take a look at the code. I think you'll learn a lot of great stuff there. Uh, but then if you see something you don't like or there's that commandlet that you've been using and, boy, why don't those people ever add that switch that I've been telling them to do, uh, go add it yourself and do a pull request. Awesome. So yeah, really get involved. That's the big, that's the big takeaway. Download it, use it, try it, and, and just get involved. And, and yeah, you've really got a huge amount of, of great opportunity that we've shown today that you can utilize in your organization. So that's the end of the show for today. Thanks for joining us. Make sure you check out the resources that are available on the page as well. More resources to help you learn, help you develop with PowerShell and Linux. And we'll hopefully see you again soon in another video. Thanks and bye for now. Cheers.